The question is, given these results, how should we approach them and who should we aim, end up treating? We know that the population at risk changes as LDLs get lower. You get more patients with diabetes, you get more patients with hypertension. They're the ones who continue to have cardiovascular events at low LDL levels. That secondary atherosclerosis driver has to be there. It is not just simply a matter of what LDL you have. It's a matter of the risk. And we know that this study was designed with a 2% per year uh, event rate, which is on the high side for people with stable coronary disease. It's usually about 1.5% a year. So how do we approach this? Well, there are two schools of thought. There are those people that believe that we should actually use targets. And they would say that in people matching the description of those going into Fourier, i.e. those patients with established cardiovascular disease and additional risk factors, we should use additional LDL lowering therapies to achieve an LDL cholesterol of 1.2 or approximately that millimoles per litre. 60 milligrams per deciliter, or 50 to 60 milligrams per deciliter. The other approach would be to say, what is the risk of the patients going in? So the ones with higher event rates would be the ones that we should actually treat. So maybe we should treat people who are smokers, maybe we should treat people who have established disease plus diabetes, and those should be our priority for actually giving this new therapy to. And it doesn't really matter what the LDL cholesterol is, it is too high for them. And those are two perfectly acceptable for ways of looking at the problem, and depending on which health system you are, they will choose one or the other. The problem with PCSK9 inhibitors is that then they're not the only thing in the market. They're also Fourier was designed and actually executed with people predominantly taking statins. The reality is that ezetimibe is going off patent in the near future and we also have outcomes evidence with ezetimibe that it will reduce events by a further 15 odd percent on top of optimal statin therapy. If you look in the details of the Improve It study, it actually had two components. It had a pre-optimization stage before randomization. So patients initially went in with an LDL of 2.6, but it dropped to 1.8 after the initial optimization of statin therapy. Thereafter, they were randomized, and they get another 0.4 millimoles dropped to the 1.4 millimoles end point, which gave the reduction. So that gives us a clue about how we're probably going to actually use Fourier in a real sense. Your people will still need to be optimized on statin therapy and it is obvious in the Fourier population and in population databases that a quarter of them still aren't. They can go to higher doses of statin. After that we have evidence with an oral off-patent agent and I'm afraid financial reasons let alone anything else, let alone convenience, alone evidence and long-term safety means that ezetimibe is likely to be the second choice in most health systems. Thereafter, there is going to be a population that is suitable for evolucumab and hopefully for other PCSK9 inhibitors as the data comes in from, the, let's say, the Odyssey Outcomes trial that is going on with alirocumab later on, in, uh, is resulted to do later this year. We are going to be looking at a population of high-risk patients that will benefit from this. Of course that will include the statin intolerant because ezetimibe is not a very strong drug and we have plenty of people who are statin intolerant. Maybe somewhere three to five percent of patients cannot tolerate statins at anywhere near a high dose. Adding ezetimibe is not going to make much difference to them. So that adding a PCSK9 inhibitor is a very very useful in that group. We have the people with genetic hypercholesterolemia syndromes, the familial poly, uh, the monogenic familial hypercholesterolemia and the polygenic familial hypercholesterolemia. They always have high LDL levels and many of them can't be controlled to LDLs of 2, let alone 1.5 millimoles per litre with a statin and ezetimibe. So that group, which is now 1 in 250 of the population, of whom a, a considerable portion do have coronary disease would be another group that's obvious to select for PCSK9s. 
Thereafter, it is going to be the high-risk group within the established secondary prevention population. And which are the highest groups? Those with autoimmune disease, those with diabetes, those with diabetes and hypertension or mild renal impairment and hypertension, all of which increase cardiovascular risk despite low LDLs. In those people, an LDL of 2 may not be good enough let it, for one reason, amongst others, that many of them have insulin resistance and so the calculated LDLs that we lab laboratories typically give out are actually an underestimate of the real LDL that those patients have. In fact, if you look at their ApoB concentrations or their non-HDL concentrations, they remain raised. And that might be a group, who, at least some of whom, would benefit from PCSK9 inhibition. How much of this we're going to use and which of those and how far deep, deeply we're going to go into those groups is going to be a decision that is the health systems are going to have to make based on prioritization within their health economies. If you have a health economy that is prepared to spend a lot of money on health outcomes and drugs, then you'll have likely a lower threshold than if you're in a health economy that has a very limited budget and can only afford to actually use a small amount of these drugs in the highest risk patients. I'm afraid we cannot get away from gradients of wealth, but we can get away from gradients in health.